Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, we're gonna talk about transpulmonary pressure. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off by giving you a simplified diagram of the chest cavity. So inside our chest, we have our lungs and the lungs are going to be surrounded by two things. So the first thing, the outer part, is going to be the chest wall and the inner thing is going to be the pleural sac. Now inside the pleural sac, we have the intrapleural space and the intrapleural space is going to have a certain pressure inside of it. Now let's just say that outside the person we have a barometric pressure of zero centimeters of water. And inside the intrapleural space we have intrapleural pressures. So we have negative 10 at the top of the lungs, negative 5 in the middle, and then negative 2.5 at the bottom. And this is because the person is standing, so the lungs are being pulled down by gravity, therefore the pressure at the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top. Now let's just say we take a huge needle and impale the person's chest cavity. And when we do this, this causes air to rush into the pleural sac. And when this occurs, the pressure inside the intrapleural space has increased to zero. So now the pressure inside the intrapleural space is equal to the pressure outside the person. Now because of this increased pressure, this causes the lungs to collapse. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how much pressure it would take to reinflate the lungs. And when we, in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're gonna take the needle out and put in a chest tube. And this chest tube is going to remove the air that flowed into the intrapleural space. And we're gonna see how much air we have to remove before the lungs start to fully inflate again. And we're gonna do this by looking at this graph here. So remember, the more air we remove from the intrapleural space, the lower the pressure of the intrapleural space becomes. So on this graph here, we have lung volume in liters, and at the x-axis, we have the intrapleural pressure. So if we were to graph the amount of air that we remove, and the, which produces a decrease in pressure, and see how the lung's volume changes over different pressures, what we would get is a curve some something like this. So what we see here is that first of all, it takes a lot of air removal to get the lungs back open after they are completely collapsed. So it doesn't, it takes until we get to around negative 10 centimeters of water for the lungs to start inflating again. And the pressure must drop significantly therefore before this occurs. So the pressure had to drop significantly before the lungs started to increase in their volume again. So this limb is called the inflationary curve or inflationary limb because you're starting off at a collapse state and putting air in, therefore causing the volume to increase. Now, what if we were to do the opposite? What if we were to take a fully inflated lung and remove the air from it and cause it to collapse? So if we were to take a fully inflated lung and increase the intrapleural pressure, what would that limb look like? Well, it would look something like this. So if we start from a fully inflated lung and start increasing the intrapleural pressure, we see that the lung volume starts to decrease. But the curve, this curve, looks a lot different than the green curve. And the difference between these two curves is something called hysteresis. So this curve here is called the deflationary limb or curve, and the difference between these two curves is hysteresis. And we're going to talk about why these two curves differ in shape in a little bit. So first of all, we have to discuss what causes the volume to change. So in order to understand this, let's take a balloon, and let's just say that the pressure inside the balloon is equal to zero, and the pressure outside the balloon is equal to negative 10. So what would happen to the balloon? Well, the balloon would expand. And the reason why is because the pressure inside the balloon is greater than the pressure outside the balloon. And it would continue to expand until the pressure inside the balloon is equal to the pressure outside of the balloon. So negative 10. So now, what if we were to take the same scenario, but we were to lower the balloon pressure to negative 10 and raise the atmosphere pressure to zero? Well, what would happen is that the balloon would shrink. And it would shrink until the until the pressure inside the balloon is equal to the pressure outside. So the balloon would collapse. So what we see here is that it's the difference in pressure across the balloon's wall that drives volume change. And we call this difference in pressure inside the lungs the transpulmonary pressure, which is given by this equation here. 
So the PTP is the transpulmonary pressure, which is the pressure difference across the wall of the lung. The PA is the alveolar pressure. So this is the pressure inside the alveoli. And the PIPS is the pleural pressure. So when the transpulmonary pressure is positive, this means that the lung is going to expand. And when it's negative, the lung is going to collapse. So what causes the difference between the two curves that we saw? So remember that the difference between these two curves is called hysteresis. And the, and the main thing that you have to focus on to describe this difference is to look at the slope. So what we see here is that the y-axis is volume and the x-axis is pressure. Therefore, these at any point on these two curves, the slope of that point is going to be equal to the compliance because your compliance is equal to a change in volume over change in pressure. Now, when the lung collapses, this causes a deficit of surfactant. So surfactant is this is the, are these molecules that basically decrease the surface tension. And when you get rid of this surfactant, which occurs when you basically collapse a lung, this decreases the amount of surfactant, which increases the surface tension, which basically makes it harder for the lung to expand. So since the deflationary curve starts off at a higher volume, there is a greater amount of surfactant. So this causes the compliance to be greater in the inflated lung. So this is why right here, when you compare this point to this point here, it takes a lot less pressure in order to get the lung inflated again on the deflationary curve because you already have a significant amount of surfactant. Whereas in this curve, when you fully collapsed it, the surfactant production decreases, so it takes a lot of pressure to uh, release in order to get that lung inflated again. And it takes a while for that surfactant to start building up in the lung again. So it's because of the decrease in surfactant that the lung that was completely collapsed needs a lot more pressure to be taken away in order to expand. So I hope this video helped you understand what transpulmonary pressure is, and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.